You still got 20 seconds before you sing, Audrey. Merry Christmas. Let us worship God. Thank you, Mark, for your ministry of music. Merry Christmas, everyone. You know, there's always something very special. I know it's foggy. It's more like Alabama weather for this time of year than it is Wisconsin. You know, I'm a lover of snow, but that's, um, that's another factor. But, but to, it's to gather something, and something about these evening services. This one, Good Friday and Easter, are a very special time. You can almost feel the power of the mystery, you know, this pervading... As, as I said on Facebook, God whispering into our heart. So I pray that tonight be a special night and a meaning-filled Christmas for all of you. At this time, I will turn it over to Patty, see whatever announcements we may happen to have. Well, I'll join in in our first Christmas carol, O Come, All You Faithful. Oh, come ye, oh, come 
be seated. Let's join in together for our call to worship. Tonight, old dreams die and new dreams come to life. The promise is fulfilled. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Hope gives way to joy and prayer to proclamation. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Our candles illuminate our story. Dawn inv invades midnight. The light of the world has come. Glory, Glory to God, God in the in highest the and in on earth peace. And this light is a light for all, igniting a flame within the soul, warming us from within, radiating love, light lighting our lives with the presence of God Come alive in human flesh within us and among us now and always. Glory, Glory to God, God in the highest, and on earth, earth peace, peace, goodwill good to all. all. Let's join together in our prayer of invocation. O holy God, we hear the story of shepherds and magi, of maiden and carpenter, of prophets and angels, and we too come to Bethlehem for a blessing. You are born in our hearts because you have chosen the weakness of our bodies for your birth. We are filled with love because you have offered us your spirit, your life, and your light. We are filled with faith because all that is meek and lowly and humble in us and in creation become holy this night. Our salvation has come into this holy time and we say together, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace and goodwill to all. Amen. Thank you, Patty. We gather on nights like tonight to be reminded of a great love, that God would come to us in an unlikely event as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger because there was no room in the inn. And that God went on, that our Lord went on then in his ministry, just three years of adult ministry to change the world. Otherwise, if he had not, we would not be here. He loves us. And I think the greatest message that all of us need to carry away from here is that we are given a love, a gift of love that the world has never known. It's my prayer that we can take and make that love our own and share it with others. So in the spirit of confession, would you please join together with me in our prayer of confession? Let us pray. Gracious God, who promised to send a redeemer to your people, we confess that we have not trusted your promise, but have busied ourselves with activities which obstruct its fulfillment. We give presents, but sometimes fail to be present with one another. We socialize with friends, but sometimes fail to welcome the stranger in our midst. Forgive us, God, for our busyness and our lack of trust. Teach us to wait with expectant patience for fulfillment of our promise to us. Please know that our God 
is slow to anger and abounding in, fast, in, fast, in, in steadfast love. Let us praise this God of grace now and forevermore. Would you please at this time continue because our format is a little bit different on Christmas Eve. Join me together in our Lord's Prayer. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So we are actually playing with technology today, Sheila and I, to take a load off of Mark, who's doing such a stellar job. So I don't know if these old pipes will allow me to do this too many more times, but I'm going to be singing O Holy Night, and I actually pulled it up on Spotify, the version that's in a key that I can sing. <laughs> Because in most of the keys, as Mark is, when we've done it in the past, the key it's usually, unless you can transpose in a spot, we get to those high notes. They're just pretty darn high. So uh, let me get this queued up, and we will, we will, we will begin. Okay. Okay, here we go. I, since I'm mic'd up here, I'm going to put this mic down here. O oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth a thrill of hope the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn fall on your knees oh he the angel voice says oh night divine Oh, night, when Christ was born. Oh, night, oh, night, oh, night, oh, night divine. taught us to love one another. His law is love, and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother. And in his name, all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name. Christ 
is the Lord. Oh, praise his name forever. His power and glory ever more proclaim His power and glory Very nice. Our scripture reading is Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world shall be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be enrolled each to his own city. And Joseph also went up to Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judah, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was one of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him in the inn. Please join in our next hymn, Joy to the World. Please stand. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven. Sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world, truth and grace, and makes the nations free. The glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. Of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. Would you please be seated? Now is a time for telling stories. Some of you know who know me really well, and Patty, you wanted to take wood carving lessons. This is a story about a wood carver. I've shared this story before. But when Grace found this, I mean, it's just like, it's the Christmas miracle of, John, of, of Jonathan Toomey. At first I thought, this would make a good little stage play. We could act it out sometime. I could be carving something, but he carves a lot better than me. But, but, um, but I did teach at my ad and, and some things, so I've done a fair amount of that. So let's not have time. 
working with first responders so much these days, but it's always good. It's always good to tell the story. And because it's one of those stories, because of copyright, we can't really show the pictures. So in your mind's eye, just pretend like we're sitting by the fire and I'm telling you a story. The village children called him Mr. Gloomy, but in fact his name was Toomey, Mr. Jonathan Toomey. And though it's not quite kind to call people names, this one fit quite well. For Jonathan Toomey seldom smiled and he never laughed. He went about mumbling and grumbling and muttering and sputtering, grumping and griping. He complained that the church bells rang too often, that the birds sang too shrilly, and that the children played too loudly. Huh, that's not the kind of guy you'd like to be around, right? Mr. Toomey was a woodcarver. Some said he was the best woodcarver in the whole valley. He spent his days sitting at a workbench carving beautiful shapes from blocks of pine and hickory and chestnut wood, and I would suggest uh, in, in England, probably London, or basswood as well. And after supper, he sat in his straight back chair near the fireplace, smoking his pipe and staring into the flames. Jonathan Toomey wasn't an old man, but if you saw him, you might think that he was. The way he walked bent forward with his head down, you would have noticed his eyes, the clear blue of the August sky, and you wouldn't see the dimple in his chin or in his face since his face was mostly hidden with a shaggy, untrimmed beard speckled with sawdust and wood shavings. And depending on what he ate that day, the crumbs of bread or a bit of potato or dried gravy. In other words, he didn't groom himself very well. The village people didn't know it, that there was a reason for his gloom, a reason for his grumbling, a reason why he walked hunched over as if he was carrying a great weight on his shoulders. Some years earlier, when Jonathan Toomey was young and full of life and full of love, his wife and baby had become very sick. And because those were the days before hospitals and medicines and skilled doctors and nurses, his wife and baby died three days apart from each other. So Jonathan Toomey packed up his belongings into a wagon and he traveled till his tears stopped. He settled into a tiny house at the end of a village, at the edge of a village to do his wood carving. So one day in early December, there was a knock on Jonathan Toomey's door. Mumbling and grumbling, he went to answer it. There stood a woman with a young boy I'm Widow McDowell. I'm new to your village. This is my son Thomas, the woman said. I'm seven and I know how to whistle, said Thomas, the little boy. Whistling is pish posh, said the woodcarver gruffly. I need something carved, said the woman. And she told Jonathan about a very special set of Christmas figures her grandfather had carved for her when she was a girl. And after I moved here, I discovered that they were lost. She explained, I had hoped that by some miracle, I would find them again, but that hasn't happened. There's no such thing as miracles, the woodcarver told her. Now, could you describe the figure to me? Th there were sheep, two of them with, with curly wool, added Thomas. Yes, two, said the widow, and a cow, an angel, Mary, Joseph, baby Jesus, and the wise men. Three of them, added Thomas. Will you take the job, asked the widow McDowell. I will. I'm grateful. How soon can you have them ready? They will be ready when they are ready, he said. But I must have them by Christmas. They mean very much to me. I, I can't remember a Christmas without them. Christmas is pish posh, said Jonathan gruffly, and he shut the door. The following week, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door, muttering and sputtering. He went to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell and Thomas. E Excuse me, said the widow, but, but Thomas has been begging to come and, and watch you work at woodcarving. He says he wants to be a woodcarver when he grows up and would like to watch you since you're the very best in all the valley. I, I'll be quiet. 
You won't even know that I'm here. Please, please. You can almost hear a child saying that, can't you? Piped in Thomas. With a grumble, the woodcarver stepped aside to let them in. He pointed to a stool near his workbench. No talking, no jiggling, no noise, he ordered Thomas. Kind of like sometimes parents will do with their kids, but that's okay. Don't worry about it. The widow McDowell handled Mr. Toomey a warm loaf of cornbread as a token of thanks. And then she took out her knitting and she sat down out of the way in a rocking chair in a far corner of the cottage. Not there, bellowed the woodcarver. No one sits in that chair. So she moved to the straight back chair by the fire. Thomas sat very still. Once when he needed to sneeze, he pressed his finger under his nose to, to try and hold it back, but you know how hard that is. And once when he wanted desperately to scratch his leg, he counted to 20 to keep his mind off the itch because there's no jiggling, no wiggling. After a very long time, Thomas cleared his throat and whispered, <clears throat> Mr. Toomey, can I ask you a question? The woodcarver glared at Thomas, then he shrugged his shoulders and grunted. Thomas decided it meant yes, so he went on. Is that my sheep you're carving? The woodcarver nodded and grunted again. And after a very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but you're carving my sheep all wrong. The widow McDowell's knitting needles stopped clicking. Jonathan Toomey, his knife stopped carving. And Thomas went on. It's, it's a beautiful sheep, nice and curly, but my sheep looked happy. That's pish posh, said Mr. Toomey. Sheep are sheep. They can't look happy. Mine did, answered Thomas. They, they knew they were with the baby Jesus, so they were happy. And after that, Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. And when the church bells rang at 6 o'clock in the evening, Mr. Toomey grumbled under his breath about the awful noise. And the widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas sneezed three times, then thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a supper of cornbread and boiled potatoes, the woodcarver sat down at his bench, and he picked up his knife. He picked up the sheep. He worked until his eyelids began to droop shut. And hopefully that won't happen to all of you tonight. A few days later, there was a knock again on the woodcarver's door. Griping and grumbling, he went to answer it, and there again stood the widow and her son. May, may I watch again? I will be quiet, said Thomas. He settled himself on the stool very quietly, while his mother laid a basket of sweet-smelling raisin buns on the table. The teapot is warm, Mr. To Mr. Toomey said gruffly, his head bent over his work. While Mr. Toomey carved, the widow McDowell poured tea. She touched the woodcarver gently on the shoulder and placed a cup of tea and a bun next to him. He pretended not to notice, but soon both the plate and the cup were empty. Thomas tried to eat the bun his mother had given him as quietly as he could. But it's almost impossible at seven to eat a warm, sticky raisin bun without making those smacking and licking and satisfying noises. And when Thomas had finished, he tried to sit quietly. And once, he almost hiccuped, but he took a deep breath and he held it until his face turned red. And once without thinking, he began to swing his legs. But a glare from the woodcarver stopped him, and he kept him so still that his legs fell asleep. After a very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, can I ask you a question? Mm. Is that my cow you're carving? Nod and grunt. After a very long time went by, then Thomas cleared his throat <clears throat> and said, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but, but I must tell you something. That, that's a beautiful cow, the most beautiful cow I've ever seen, but it's not right. My cow looked proud. That's pish posh, growled the woodcarver. Cows are cows. They can't look proud. My cow did. It knew that Jesus chose to be born in, in a barn, so it was proud. 
Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon, and the only sounds that could be heard were the scraping of the carving knife, the humming of the widow McDowell, and the click-click of her knitting needles. And when the church bells chimed at 6 o'clock, Mr. Toomey muttered under his breath about the noise, and the widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas shook first one leg and then the other to wake him up, and he thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a supper of boiled potatoes and raisin buns, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his carving knife. He picked up the cow. He worked until his eyelids began to droop. A few days later, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. He smoothed down his hair, and he went to answer it. <clears throat> so some things were beginning to change. At the door were the widow and her son. May I wash again, asked Thomas. As Mrs. McDowell heated, uh, warmed the tea, and put a plate of fresh molasses cookies on the workbench, and I know I'm making Ron hungry, Thomas watched the woodcarver work on the figure of an angel. And after a very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me, is that my angel you're carving? Yes. And would you do me a favor by, of telling me exactly what I'm doing wrong? Well, my angel looks like one of God's most important angels because it was sent to baby Jesus. And just how does one make an angel look important, asked the woodcarver. You'll be able to do it, said Thomas. You're the best woodcarver in the valley. After another very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me, may I ask a question? Do you ever stop talking, asked the woodcarver. My mother says I don't. She says I could learn about the virtue of silence from you. Whoops, under his beard, the woodcarver's face turned pink. The widow McDowell's face turned red as the scarf she was knitting. Well, speak up. What's your question? Will you please teach me to carve? I'm a very busy man, grumbled the woodcarver. But he put down the important angel. You will carve a bird. A robin, I hope, said Thomas. I like robins. With a piece of charcoal, the woodcarver sketched a robin on a piece of, of brown paper, and he handed Thomas a small block of pine and a knife. And he showed him how to lop the corners off the block and slowly smooth the edges of the wood into curves. Thomas copied the woodcarver's strokes, head bent, tongue working from side to side of his lower lip as he's really concentrating. And when the church bells chimed six o'clock, Jonathan Toomey was holding Thomas's hand in his, guiding the knife along the edge of a wing. And he didn't hear them ringing. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas brushed the wood shavings from his shirt, then he reached out and brushed two especially large pieces of wood shavings from Jonathan Toomey's beard. He thanked the woodcarver for teaching him how to carve. Later, after a supper of, get this, boiled potatoes and molasses cookies, Jonathan Toomey went to his workbench. He thought for a long time. He sketched drawing after drawing, and finally, after he picked up his carving knife, he picked up the angel, and he carved until his eyelids began to droop again. A few days later, there was a knock again on the woodcarver's door. Mr. Kumi uh, jumped up to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell with a bouquet of pine boughs and holly sprigs dotted with berries, and there stood Thomas clutching his partly carved robin. While Thomas and Mr. Toomey carved, Mrs. McDowell put the bouquet in a jar of water. She scrubbed Mr. Toomey's kitchen table and set the jar in the center on a pretty cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies, which she found in a drawer below the cupboard. Next, I will carve the wise men and Joseph, the woodcarver said to Thomas. Perhaps before I begin, you will tell me about the mistakes I'm going to make. Well, said Thomas, my wise men were wearing their most beautiful robes because they were going to visit Jesus and my Joseph was leaning over baby Jesus like he was protecting him. He looked very serious. It wasn't until the church bells had chimed and the widow and her son were preparing to go that Mr. Toomey saw a jar of pine boughs and a scrubbed table and the cloth embroidered with lilies of valley. I found the cloth in a drawer. I thought it would look very pretty 
on the table, the widow McDowell said, smiling. Never open that drawer, the woodcarver said harshly. When the two had left, Jonathan put the cloth away. That evening after a supper of boiled potatoes, a woodcarver worked on Joseph and the wise men until his eyelids began to droop. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door, and he dusted the crumbs from his beard and brushed the sawdust from his shirt, and at the door was a widow McDowell and Thomas. All afternoon, Thomas watched the woodcarver work, and when it was time to leave, Jonathan said to Thomas, I'm about to begin the last two figures, Mary and the baby. Can you tell me how the figures looked? They were the most special of all, said Thomas. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to his mother, and Mary looked like she loved him very much. Thank you, Thomas, said the woodcarver. Tomorrow is Christmas. Is there any chance the figures will be ready, the widow McDowell asked. They will be ready when they're ready. I, under I understand, said the widow, and she handed Jonathan two packages. Merry Christmas, she said. Jonathan folded his arms across his chest. I want no presents, he said harshly. That's exactly why we're giving them, answered the widow. She put them down on the table and left. And Jonathan sat down at the table. Slowly he opened the first package. Inside was a beautiful red scarf, hand-knit, warm, and bright, and he tied the scarf around his neck. The other package held a robin, crudely carved of pine. A smile twitched across the corners of Jonathan's mouth as he ran his fingers over the lopsided wings. He dusted the fireplace panel with his sleeve and he placed the robin exactly in the center so he could look at it from his chair. The woodcarver did not eat supper that day. Instead, he began to sketch the final figures, Mary and Jesus. He drew Mary, then he wadded the sketch into a ball and tossed it on the floor. It just wasn't good enough. He drew the baby, wadded the sketch into a ball and tossed it where the first one was. He sketched again and again, and once more he crumpled the paper. Soon there was a small mountain of crumpled, crumpled papers at his feet. He picked up a block of wood and he tried to carve, but his knife would not do what he wanted it to do. He hurled a chunk of wood into the fireplace and he sat staring into the flames. When he heard the church bells annoying the midnight service, announcing the midnight service, he got up. He slowly opened the drawer beneath the cupboard, the drawer he had told the widow never to open. And from it he took the cloth embroidered with lilies and of the valley and daisies. He took out a rough woolen shawl and a lace handkerchief he took out a tiny white baby blanket and a little pair of blue socks. He placed each gently on the floor. And from the bottom of the drawer, he lifted out a picture frame, beautifully carved of deep brown chestnut wood. And in the frame was a charcoal sketch of a woman sitting in a rocking chair holding a baby. The baby's arms were reaching up, touching the woman's face. The woman was looking down at the baby, smiling. Jonathan sat down in his rocking chair and held a picture against his chest because we know who that sketch was, don't we? He rocked slowly, his eyes closed. Two tears trailed from each eye into his beard. And when he finally took the picture to his workbench, he began to carve. His fingers worked quickly and surely. He carved all through the night, and the next day there was a knock on the door in the widow McDowell on her door. And when she opened it, there was the woodcarver, his neck wrapped in a red scarf, holding a wooden box stuffed with straw. Mr. Toomey, said the widow, what a surprise, Merry Christmas. The figures are ready, he said as he stepped inside. And from the box, Jonathan unpacked two curly sheep, happy sheep because they were with Jesus. He unpacked a proud cow and an angel, a very important angel with mighty wings stretching from its shoulders right down to the hem of its gown. And he unpacked three wise men wearing the most wonderful robes with fur falling in rich folds that he had carved. He unpacked a serious and caring Joseph, and he unpacked Mary wearing a rough woolen shawl, looking down lovingly at her precious baby son. Jesus was smiling and reached up to touch his mother's face. 
That day, Jonathan went to the Christmas service with a widow, with Widow McDowell and Thomas. And that day in the churchyard, the, ch the village children saw Jonathan throw back his head, showing his eyes as clear as the August sky. And he laughed, and his laugh, nobody ever called him Mr. Gloomy again. Thus ends the story, told in another way. This time, as David will sing an appropriate song, Mary's Boy Child. Uh, this is one of my favorite Christmas songs, uh, Mary's Boy Child. And seeing that I have our ninth granddaughter here, Analia, who is not quite five months old. Yeah, so it's special. So. Long time ago in Bethlehem, so the Holy Bible say, Mary's boy child, Jesus Christ, was born on Christmas Day. Hark now hear the angels sing, a new king's born today. Then man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. Trumpets sound and angels sing, listen to what they say. That man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. While shepherds watch the flocks by night, they see a bright new star. Then hear a choir of angels sing, the music seem to come from afar. Now Joseph and his wife Mary come to Bethlehem that night. They find no place to bear her child, not a single room was inside. Hark now hear the angels sing, a new king is born today, and man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. Trumpets sound and angels sing, listen to what they say, that man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. By and by they find a little nook in a stable so forlorn. In a manger there, so cold and dark, Mary's little boy was born. Hark now, hear the angels sing, a new king is born today, and man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. Trumpets sound and angels sing, listen to what they say, that man will live forevermore because of Christmas Day. All right. Thank you. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, as we gather here this evening, 
It's been a tough year for some people. Some people have lost loved ones. Some people have lost their health, as you know, God. Some people have lost their jobs and lost a number of different things. It's a bittersweet time for many, many people, gracious God. But you come to us to remind us that as dark as our world may at times seem, that you bring the light of the world and that there's no darkness, no matter how dark we may find ourselves, that can overcome the light of your love. We know, God, there's a lot of hatred, a lot of distrust, a lot of anger, a lot of polarization, a lot of these things going on, horrible things happening. But God, you have told us, and you show us again and again and again, that no matter what is thrown at us, love, love, your love, will always have the final word. That is why we gather, to feel that love and to carry that love and to share that love. Each of us, God, is lifting up the prayers of our own heart this evening and in this time. Prayers for healing, prayers, prayers of healing of a spirit of body, mind, and spirit. Prayers of hope for those who may have lost their way. We know, God, that you bring peace, that you bring hope, that you bring love, and you bring joy. Let us open our hearts to that, to that great gift that you offer us on this night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Freely and richly have we been blessed, and we have shared our gifts, I presume, already this evening in our gifts of love in the back. So at this time, Mark will play a, a song of dedication as we've been traditionally doing during the pandemic um, to kind of dedicate those gifts in our sharing.
gracious and always loving God, we would ask you accept these gifts, which we, your people, offer up to you. Grant us the causes to which they're devoted be causes of love, given to your glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray, we share, and we live. So let's sing. Would you please be seated? Tonight is a night for gifts, the greatest gift that the world has known, the bread of life and the cup of love. So would you please join together with me? And by the way, we have a number of visitors here today, this evening. Um, depending on your tradition, I certainly hope you feel comfortable taking communion with us. Uh, if you wish, because we have open communion here. So anybody is welcome to be to welcome at Christ's table. So having said that, would you please join together with me in our liturgy? God of light in whom there is no shadow, your gift to us are from the very beginning of time. They continued with our ancient ancestors like Noah, whom you blessed with the colorful promise of a rainbow. And like Sarah and Abraham, whom you blessed with a child, whose descendants as many as the stars of the sky, were to be a light to the nations. In the desert you gave the gift of manna, 
and of living water to the weary pilgrims that you led. fragile and vulnerable, who grew to be the very light of light, full of grace and truth, revealing your glory on earth. We thank you, O oh God, that you have sent Jesus Christ to bring life, immortality to light. Help us to receive your gifts with joy and humility. As we receive this bread and wine, may we open our hearts to receive your love and grace in Jesus Christ and receive the love and support of one another. Be born among us. The presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, when he gathered with his disciples in a prearranged upper room, took bread as was the custom. He blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And as was the custom, Jesus took and he poured into a cup from which his disciples would drink. And he said, this is the New Testament of my blood which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. It is the cup of love shared out with all of us that we in turn might share that love. Would the ushers please come forward? Just if you are visiting us, just to remind you what we're going to do is uh, we're going to be handing out both bread, uh, individual pieces of bread and individual cup, and just hold them, and then I will lead us through the process, the liturgy, of taking the bread and then the cup.
Remembering Jesus, that he is the bread of life, let us take and eat. Remembering that he loves us, each and every one of us, let us drink in remembrance of him. Would you please rise? Prayer of Thanksgiving. We give you thanks, O God, that you have come to us through Jesus Christ, both in the midst of time, in the history, in the city of Bethlehem, and the timeless presence of Christ's Spirit, as we receive the gifts of bread and wine. Send us out into the world rejoicing, ready to share your love with the people we meet, through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Um, I will be singing a uh, lullaby tonight called Still, Still, Still. second time I, I've worked to get her to sing and she got a lovely voice you know so it's um, you know it's just um, we'll, we'll do more next year we'll do more next year so it's a perfect perfect fitting for where we go from here because now we light the Christ candle uh, having lit the other candles of peace hope love and joy and what we will do then following that after I say some words about that the ushers will come forward we will hopefully we can we can dim the lights a little bit and we will go through the verses, of course, one verse, first verse being Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht, auf Deutsch, so you know German. So it's, but the words are going to be up there, in case you don't. 
Uh, but then once we run out of verses, the light will be passed around. Um, we'll ask you to come out humming the song and go in silence. Merry Christmas. Jesus is the light of the world. And he also said we are the light of the world that it is our responsibility to bear that light. So at this time, I will light the Christ candle. Actually, I'm going to use a candle holder. I'd be nervous that uh, this will be one of those bloopers that you don't want to show up. You know, there is a, an old Jewish Hasidic saying that it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Let there be light. So at this time, the light of the world has come. So at that point, we will start to sing Silent Night or Heilige Nacht. Please rise. Hele Nacht, Heilige Nacht, alle Schlaf, einsam wacht, nur dann trat
Keep humming. Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, buddy. How are you? Merry Christmas, my friend. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. Christmas. Merry Christmas. You're just growing so much. You'll be telling mom pretty soon. Merry Christmas. 